It is now my privilege to introduce our special awardee. From time to time, the Commission on Women decides to bestow an award on someone who is not actively practicing or was actively practicing law in the United States, or someone whose unusual public service achievements require us to honor that person. But how does one introduce one of the most famous women in the world? I mean, the author of Dear Socks, Dear Buddy, Kids Letters to the First Pets, uh, the person whom her daughter Chelsea apparently once told the school nurse that her mother was far too busy to be bothered, but she could call her father. <laughs> well, it's a challenge, but it's a lot of fun. New York State Senator, or New York U.S. Senator from New York State, Hillary Diane Rodham Clinton, was born here in the Chicago area, right here. and early on embraced deep religious convictions and a sense of direct social action. An honor student at Wellesley, she was senior class president, and spent a summer in Washington, D.C. working for, are you ready for this? The House Republican Conference. Her incandescent speaking ability was evident in her historic and passionate Wellesley commencement address, which included a line paraphrasing an Anne Scheibner poem Quote, the challenge now is to practice politics as the art of making what appears impossible, possible, end quote. At Yale Law School, she fell in love with Bill Clinton and also developed an abiding interest in children's legal needs. After graduation, she became a staff attorney for the Children's Defense Fund, but left the next year for the House Judiciary Committee's legal staff, an opportunity where she worked on the Nixon impeachment proceedings. In 1975, she married Bill Clinton and moved to Fayetteville, Arkansas, where both of them taught on the University of Arkansas School of Law faculty. And I have it on very good authority that she was the superior instructor. <laughs> when Clinton was elected state attorney general two years later, they moved to Little Rock and she joined the Rose Law Firm, eventually becoming its first woman partner. By 1978, she was Arkansas's first lady, and two years later, the mother of Chelsea. In 1987, when the American Bar Association decided to form a commission on women in the profession, ABA President Robert McCrate called on Hillary Clinton to serve as its first chair. And as our perspective story tells you, she initially was hesitant about taking that post. But it was a brilliant stroke and a boon to the ABA that she accepted. Her leadership and her consensus building skills were visible everywhere in conducting the nation's first ever set of public hearings on the status of women in the profession around the country, in shaping the resulting report and recommendations that identified some concrete actions that this association could take to improve the lot of women lawyers, and in assuring its passage in the House of Delegates. She also initiated, 15 years ago, the Margaret Brent Women Lawyers of Achievement Award, thinking that this was an appropriate way to show the positives and to emphasize that so many people have contributed to making this profession better. I think she was worried that that first year, nobody would come. <laughs> but over 500 showed up at that moment, which was a sellout. So it's done pretty well since, and we appreciate the vision that created those awards. As a candidate's wife and then first lady of the land, her penchant for policy and her continuing advocacy for women and children's rights made her both a role model and occasionally a target. There was perhaps no more scrutinized woman in the country. At times, she took comfort in Eleanor Roosevelt's quip, a woman is like a tea bag. You never know how strong she is until she gets into hot water. <laughs> Yet amidst the occasional turbulence, she held her family together with dignity and grace, and she even had time to write a best-selling book, It Takes a Village, and Other Lessons Children Teach Us. She even won a Grammy Award for its recording. And she was not silenced. In her keynote at the 1995 UN Women's Conference in Beijing, she spoke movingly that, quote, if there is one message that echoes forth from this conference, it is that human rights are women's rights, and women's rights are human rights. Mm -hmm. 
Let us not forget that among those rights are the right to speak freely and the right to be heard. In 2000, she became another pathbreaker in becoming the nation's only first lady to win election to the Senate as a sitting first lady and in my home state of New York. Her autobiography, Living History, is another blockbuster. What lies ahead? Who knows? <laughs> but for what she has accomplished in the law, as an advocate, in public service, and as a champion for women everywhere, we are delighted to bestow upon her a special award today. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome back to the ABA, Hillary Rodham Clinton. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And it is such a personal delight to be here, to be back at the ABA, and especially for this luncheon, and to share this time with these extraordinary honorees, each of whom I think has given us uh, so much, uh, not only of themselves personally, but so much in terms of wisdom about what we should be considering and hoping for in our nation and in our judicial and legal systems. You know, when um, I was asked if I would be willing to come today, it didn't take me long to say yes, because I had so much fun chairing the commission with my very hearty band of commissioners. And I wanted to express once again my appreciation to Bob McCrate, who then was president of the ABA, uh, for asking me to chair the commission when it was first established and persisting when I told him, no, I really couldn't do it. I didn't have time. And he said, well, that's the whole point. Um, young women in the law don't have time and there are still so many obstacles they face and this commission we hope will be a practical means of exploring some of these challenges and coming up with solutions so he wore me down and I said yes and I have been always grateful ever since then he gave me the great gift of commissioners and I just want to mention their names because they were just among the best uh, that I've ever served with in any capacity, and many of them are here today. Uh, Bill Fallsgraf and Lynn Heck Schaffron and Barbara Maiden and Corey Amron, uh, Judge Danell Taha, Jim Greenfield, Randy Thrower, Lisa Hill Fenning, Elaine Jones, Martha Barnett, and Sandy Dallenbert. And we were so blessed to have Elaine Weiss as our executive director. When we, yes, they deserve a, a round of applause. When we began our work, we thought we should do some hearings to try to get a better sense of what was actually happening out in the profession uh, that uh, was affecting women and men that might uh, explain some of the anecdotal evidence we each had in our own personal experience about the difficulties that women still faced in 1987, 1988, long after the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which did open doors and knock down barriers. Well, those hearings, and I really commend uh, you to the transcripts of those in the files of the commission uh, that Diane has so ably chaired uh, in the past years, because we were, I think it's fair to say, somewhat shocked by the stories we heard. Um, Danell Taha and I were reminiscing before the luncheon. Uh, she still would make a great Supreme Court justice, by the way. Um, <laughs> We were reminiscing about how we'd hear these stories of blatant discrimination, of the attitudinal discrimination that's harder to put your arms around, but often just as distressing, the extraordinary difficulties that women faced 
balancing family and work, the hardships imposed before the Family and Medical Leave Act became law in being the best lawyer one could be in whatever role in the profession one chose and fulfilling the most important responsibilities to one's family on finding a little time left for oneself. Uh, it was an overwhelming experience, and we tried to highlight some of the challenges and then set about looking for solutions which were really in the realm of trying to persuade people already in power, men and a few women, uh, to continue to tear down these barriers and to change the attitudes that stood in the way of utilizing uh, the full extent of women's contributions uh, to our profession. In the midst of all this, I think we began to worry a little bit that we were going to be known as the Downer Commission of the ABA because we were always holding seminars and panel discussions and you know, sort of lecturing and hectoring about what law firms needed to do and corporations needed to do and how much better we could be if we only uh, changed our attitudes and some of our uh, mindsets. So Elaine Weiss was visiting me in my law office in December of 1990 and we were talking about how we could not just focus attention, much needed as it was, on some of the challenges that persisted in our profession, which should, after all, lead the way in being a beacon of equality and justice. And what could we do that would bring attention to the success stories and to those women pioneers who had really demonstrated that because of their courage, because of their persistence, uh, there was a place in the law for women and that the opportunities for young women were plentiful and that in fact the glass ceiling was cracking even though it may not yet have broken. And so we hit upon the idea of an annual luncheon at the convention uh, to highlight these extraordinary women pioneers and we hoped also that we could through the nominating process find women who not only were personally successful but tried to bring others also along with them especially mentoring or serving as an example uh, reaching out to young women and men but particularly young women well when it came time to name the award, we were a little bit stuck because we knew it would be a very political process if we were to pick someone either alive today, certainly, you know, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor came immediately to mind as our first uh, Supreme Court Justice as a woman, or someone else who had served in a high position in the profession. And I was just wondering, well, who was the first woman lawyer? I certainly didn't learn that when I was in school as a young girl. It was not in my history books as far as I can remember. So we did the research and came upon this extraordinary woman, Margaret Brent. You've already heard something about her and there's a longer description of her career in Perspectives, but I was struck because I had been a litigator that she appeared in provincial court 124 times between 1642 and 1650 and she never lost. So it seemed to us that she was for all kinds of reasons including the fact that she was the first woman lawyer that we are at all aware of in uh, our then colonies and in the history of our country that this award would bear her name. Well, in the 15 years since we started, there have been just extraordinary moments uh, where women like the ones you've heard from today, who not only are successful by any standard, but never have forgotten that it isn't just success that matters. It's what you do with that success. It's the qualities you bring to the journey that you make. It's your willingness to be committed to the principles that set us apart from so many other societies and our constant 
struggle to perfect our union and to provide a platform and environment for more and more of our children to live up to their God-given potential. And so this luncheon became um, a wonderful opportunity and celebration every single year for the ABA. Coming back is, for me, a special pleasure. It was not only a great honor to serve as the first chair of the commission and to do the work with my commissioners and with the uh, leadership and staff of the ABA with whom we served, but to see the commission continue and the work that it has done in succeeding years, uh, reminding us, prodding us, raising our expectations about what we are capable of, uh, has been very rewarding to watch. I share the concerns of some of the others who have spoken already that we can never lose sight of the continuing challenges we face in our society and that there is no group of people who share a greater responsibility to ensure that we live up to our highest ideals than our lawyers. Obviously, the bar and the profession have a lot to do with how we structure ourselves, how we govern ourselves, but it also is fair to say that the standards by which we make decisions publicly and privately, how we order our relationships among one another, are due in large measure to decisions that many in this room and many, many more like you in every walk of life uh, make on a daily basis. The rule of law is one of the greatest gifts that I think we were given and that we have passed on, not only to generation after generation of Americans, but to people throughout the world. Respecting the law, realizing that it must apply fairly and equitably, using the law not as a tool to oppress and demean, but as a means to lift up and aspire. I sometimes worry today that the voices of those who are on the front lines fighting the battles, making sure that equal justice under law is not just a slogan but a reality, are not as loud as they should be, not as vigorous in standing up to power as they need to be. We have many challenges before us as a nation. Reinvigorating our commitment to our basic ideals is one of the most important obligations we in the legal profession have. I'm privileged now to serve in the United States Senate, and every day, much of what I struggle with is how we define ourselves going forward as a nation. Who are we as Americans in the 21st century? How do we illustrate, exemplify the ideals and values that so many of us believe are at the root not only of our personal success, but of our national achievements? So I am grateful that the ABA is not only still around, but still active, still willing to debate these issues, still trying to speak truth to power, hoping that there will be those who listen and respond. There are very different and even opposing views about what our Constitution means in today's world, what legal structures are best suited for us to continue to offer opportunity and provide fairness and a level playing field. And your voices are absolutely essential in the debates that we are having. I loved being a full-time lawyer. Now I'm not able to go into a courtroom, but I try to remember the techniques and the lessons that I learned in law school and in my legal career as I advocate for and 
defend those values and principles that I think are essential for America's future, just as they have been for our past. And so I am grateful that this luncheon is celebrating its 15th anniversary, that the women who have been honored are really examples for everyone, women and men alike, that their words and their deeds should spur us on to be even more committed to opening doors and clearing away obstacles and barriers to individual opportunity, and that this could not have happened anywhere else in our country except at the ABA, and it could not have happened in any other country except for ours. So let us recommit ourselves to ensuring that future generations of girls and boys will hold dear all of the values and ideals that we believe in and will be able to participate as fully as their hard work, their commitment, and their dreams can take them within a society and a legal system that keeps pushing us to be better tomorrow than we are today. Thank you all very, very much.